I'd like to give a big hello out there to all the listeners. We're so glad that you decided to join us today for our webinar. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor here at Hordes Dairyman Magazine. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Um, Hordes Dairyman and the University of Illinois have been co-hosting these presentations since 2011. We definitely want to thank um, our webinar producer, Jim Balt at the University of Illinois, and our Hordes Dairyman online media manager, Patty Herchin, for all the work that they do behind the scenes to help pull these events together every month. My co-host today is the well-known and well-respected Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. And together, we have the pleasure of welcoming Pam Rug from the University of Wisconsin-Madison as our webinar presenter today. Um, Pam Rug is a well-known milk quality expert, and her information and expertise is on, in demand all across the world. So we're really excited to have her with us here today. Her presentation is titled, Making Responsible Choices About Drug Use on Dairy Farms. And she'll be focusing on what drugs are you know, available for dairy producers to use um, when keeping their cattle healthy and some practices that can be done to ensure that these medications are used in a safe and responsible manner. The webinar this month is sponsored by Neogen Corporation. We certainly thank them for their support of this program and the help that they provide to dairy producers um, of all kinds. Mike, I'll let you take it from here to further introduce Pam and then kickstart this month's webinar. Well, very good, Abby. I appreciate that very much. And it's my honor and pleasure, actually, to introduce Dr. Pam Rug. Uh, she's both a professional and personal co-worker and friend of ours and very popular. This is her repeat appearance due to popular demand and use of the archived information. She's a very popular speaker on our webinar series. Welcome back, Pam. Pam is a native of Upper Peninsula, Michigan. She got her degrees from Michigan State, her BS and DVM. She's also pretty excited about the football game on Saturday for you football people. Uh, she was was in private practice in Wisconsin for a short period of time, and then on stabs at the University of California, Davis, at the Atlantic Veterinary College at Prince Edward Island, Michigan State University, and then spent some time with Monsanto on the RBST uh, launch as far as that goes. Currently, uh, she is professor and extension uh, a specialist and an extension specialist for the milk quality at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She has won numerous awards, or two numerous to, to read to you at this point, and has been all over the world internationally. And of course, very active right now, some of you have heard about this big China project that the University of Wisconsin Nestle is involved with, and, and Pam is a player in that as well. So Pam, obviously you're a busy young lady. I will turn the program over to you to talk about your topic using drugs responsibly on dairy farms. Dr. Pam Rue, it's your program. Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, welcome, everyone. I think the, uh, the comment on this, on my international involvement, is a, is a good start for, for the subject of using drugs responsibly on dairy farms because when we think about the, uh, the way the dairy industry has changed today, one of the most important trends for us here in the U.S. dairy industry is the role that our export market plays in uh, maintaining the milk prices that we need here to really have a nice profitable dairy industry. And in order to maintain those export markets, we have to make sure we're producing milk that's valued by the international marketplaces. And one of the things that happens in the international marketplace is there's a huge amount of testing of milk because the quality, the drug residues, the somatic cell count, the bacterial count, those issues are all issues that factor into um, basically non-tariff trade barriers. <laughs> so um, in order for us to compete, not just here in producing high quality products here in the U.S., but in order for us to keep compete in the international markets, we really have to be cognizant about producing high quality products. Now, while we're, we're all really cognizant about the, uh, the importance of producing residue-free milk, one of the interesting things that's occurred across my career, which started as a young veterinarian in, in the mid-80s, is how the expectations for um, antibiotic usage on farms and animal care in general have really changed. If you look at this slide, you'll see on the, the picture the headline of this of this uh, Huffington Post article says painkillers, antibiotics, growth hormones among 20 chemicals found in a typical glass of milk. 
This, of course, is not something we want to be out there in the Huffington Post, which is a very influential media newspaper. And if you look at that, if you're a consumer, you may perceive a risk, a, a serious risk, and you may not read any further than that headline. 20 chemicals found in a typical glass of milk. But if you even read <laughs> the, the, the first paragraph on that article, you see it's a very misleading headline. It says, a, a study from the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry reveals that a single glass of milk can contain traces of 20 painkillers, antibiotics, and growth hormones. That sounds really scary. Then you go to the next sentence, and it says, although the doses of the drugs were too small to have any effects on milk drinkers, I want you to remember the word tolerance here. They don't say tolerance, but I'm going to bring up the FDA concept of tolerance a little later on. So although the doses were too small, the mere existence of so many types offers a window into milk production across the food chain. So right now, if you're reading this Huffington Post here in the U.S., you're starting to get worried about U.S. food practices. But then the next sentence says, the researchers anal analyzed 20 types of cows, goats, and sheep's milk purchased in Spain and Morocco. Okay, so it, it isn't even U.S. But, but the issue here is this type of headline has really permeated into the consciousness of consumers. I can tell you when I fly, and I do a lot of flying, as Mike mentioned, uh, places, if I'm sitting on an airplane and somebody sits down next to me and asks what I do, tell them I'm a veterinarian working for the University of Wisconsin, focusing on preventive health care of dairy cows. Almost invariably, the first question I get asked is, hey, don't they use antibiotics in all these cows all the time? People really perceive risk. But when we look at the data, that risk really is declining. If we look at detected residues, and I'll show you some of this data in a slide or two, detected residues are declining. Our tests to detect the residues are getting more and more sensitive, and the detection limits for residues appears to be far below the level of harm to humans. And we know, those of us working in the dairy industry, that for the last 30 years, our emphasis has not been on treatment to solve problems, but on preventive health programs focusing on reducing the need for the use of antibiotics. So when we think about the changing expectations, sometimes those of us in the industry feel a little defensive. We feel like, hey, we're doing a lot of things really well. We're minimizing the antibiotic usage. What people are perceiving isn't really what we're doing. But in the consumer world, perceptions are reality. And so as an industry, we have to be responsible and responsive and make sure we're doing everything we can to create a reality that is what the consumers want. Now, just a brief foray, foray into the history of antibiotics on dairy farms and in milk. It's pretty interesting how recent this issue is. If you look historically at when concerns about antibiotics in milk um, began, they really, the first articles come up in about the 19, early 1970s. And those concerns really had nothing to do with public health or food safety. The initial concern about antibiotics in milk really originated with people who were making cheese and occasionally they had bats of cheese where the starters didn't work. And, the, and when they tested that milk, they found the starters didn't work because there were antibiotic residues in that milk. So that was, that was in the early 70s, late 60s. The issue of public health and residues in milk is pretty new. That really began in the 1980s. And the initial concern that, that came up was the potential of allergic reactions to penicillin-type drug residues in dairy products. Now, I don't know how many of you out there um, are allergic to penicillin, I'm allergic to penicillin. At least one of my children is allergic to penicillin. So we would be potentially the type of people who would, who would be affected if there were high levels of, of penicillin residues in milk. But if you look into the research literature on people actually reacting, having an allergic reaction to penicillin-type drug residues, there's no reports of this occurring for at least 40 years. So... Um, the type of testing we're doing 
appears to be effective and, and the, the levels of detection for our residues appear to be far, far below um, the level that would ever have any ability to influence human health. So that concern seems to be um, uh, well taken care of with our residue testing program. But more recently, the concern about our use of antibiotics on dairy farm has come up with people being concerned that antibiotic use on dairy farms or on any other kind of um, uh, livestock unit is contributing to the development and spread of resistant organisms. And this is really kind of the hot topic today. So when we think about why we should be looking at educating ourselves about how to use drugs properly and making sure that we're using drugs judiciously, we have to recognize that consumers are concerned that those of us in the dairy industry are overusing drugs. That may not be the reality, but that's the perception. And they're concerned that the food will contain residues of these drugs or that the food product that they consume will contain bacteria that have been exposed to residues and are thus resistant. So in order to ensure that our industry maintains the good image that we have and remains safe, we have to make sure we're going above any sort of standard to use the drugs responsibly and use them only when needed in order to maintain the well-being of the cows that we take care of. So that's a little background on this. Um, I'm going to have you do a poll here. So get ready to answer a question. And pay attention right now because I'm going to show you, describe to you a scenario. Let's say you're on your farm. It's Monday morning. Last night, two separate cows calved, and both of them delivered bull calves. One of the cows it calved was a first lactation heifer. She received no dry cow treatment. First lactation heifer, just calves. And then the second cow was a third lactation cow that had been dry treated with a commercial antibiotic product that contains penicillin and dihydrostreptomycin. So two bull calves delivered. They're on the ground today, one from a heifer, one from a third lactation cow that had received dry cow treatment. Here's the question. Your workers take care of the calves and ask you today, when can we send these bull calves to market? You've got five options to answer. Wow, First, we're running here. Uh, Abby, I'm not sure if you want to get in here and vote at this point. Uh, uh, wow, I, I've got uh, three choice. I got three choices. Uh, the easy one, that Pam, is for me to say I'm not sure. That'd be that'd be the the safest choice as far as that goes. Uh, if I'm, um, I think if I'm a, 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 a Republican, I'm going to go with the, the only the bull calf from the heifer. I'm a Democrat. I think I can ship them both immediately because anyway, uh, Abby, do you want in on this? Uh, I think this is a really good question to get our audience thinking. I'm sure there's a lot of farms that handle this very differently um, and are not probably not sure what is the most correct way to do it. So I guess my gut reaction would be that you could ship the bull calf from the heifer immediately and would need to wait on that other one, but I'm uh, not even sure exactly how long. So I'm sure Pam will tell us soon. All right. I'm going to, any last people want to vote? I'm going to close the poll. I guess I have control of that. Yep, go ahead and close it. Three, two, one, closed. Okay, our answers were, I'll tell you what the right answer is. The right answer was voted on correctly by 40% of our audience. Only the bull calf from the heifer can be shipped immediately. But, you know, we have 25% of the audience said both can be shipped immediately. We had 15% say both can be shipped in 10 days. We had 4% say both need to wait for at least 30 days. And we had 16% of the people say, just, I'm really not sure. This is, a, this is a very practical thing that happens. And the reason D is correct is because the dihydrostreptomycin, when it's administered to a dry cow, has some residue in the colostrum, and that class of drugs has a long withhold period. 
I've just put up the slide from FARAD, the Food Animal Residue Avoidance and Depletion Program, which is a source, farad.org, that we can go to to get uh, uh, information about residues. And you'll see that um, if we look at this slide in the blue box in the middle, here's the information which comes from published papers. If you've got dihydrostreptomycin um, and you've got fed colostrum from intramammary dry-treated cows, assuming the period between the treatment of the cow and the calving specified on the product label has been met, there's a 30-day meat withhold period. So here you've got a cow that received a dry cow product two months ago. You kind of forget about it. She delivers a bull calf. You got two calves on the ground. They have to be handled differently. It just shows you how complex some of these issues can be relative to actually managing the dairy farm on a day-to-day -day basis. Now let's spend a few minutes talking about some of the, the regulations. The U.S. regulations for milk residues um, are governed by the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, which is administered by the FDA. That's the minimum standard that states have to adopt as their regulations. They can adopt more stringent regulations, but that's a minimum standard. In one part of the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, it specifies the testing for antibiotic residues. And the standard is that every tanker of milk must be screened for beta-lactam residues before it's unloaded. So let's just think about this for a minute. If, so what happens is the milk tanker pulls up, it's full of milk, it pulls up at the milk processing plant, a sample is taken from that tanker, and a rapid screening test is done on that milk to look for beta-lactam residues. If that test is negative, the milk can be unloaded and processed. If that test is positive, then all the farms that have contributed to that, that tank have to have their individual milk samples from their tanks, which were collected by the trucker, tested to determine who is responsible, which farm is responsible for um, contaminating that load of milk. And of course, if, if a farm is found to be responsible, then there's a large penalty to pay and um, they can't ship milk until they're proven to be negative. Now, everybody kind of, I think, understands this rule, but one thing I think we forget about today is about 50% of the milk today on, uh, in the U.S. comes from large farms. And large farms typically ship full tankers of milk. And on many of our largest farms that are contributing about 50% of the milk, they'll be shipping two to three tankers a day. So in reality, for 50% of the milk today, they're having a tanker load of milk being tested at the processor two to three times per day. So the, the screening for these beta-lactam residues is pretty intense. So that tanker is, in effect, a producer sample for about 50% of the milk. Um, there's additional producer samples that um, the individual farm milk samples. These are milk samples that come from the bulk tank that must be tested uh, once monthly, four times per six-month period, and there's additional random testing performed. And in fact, many processors do more testing than this as well. So these are the minimum standards for residue testing. And what you'll see is that we've made tremendous progress in um, looking at and reducing the number of positive antibiotic test results. This graph shows you the, the positive antibiotic test results from 2003 to 2014. On the uh, x-axis, You've got the well on the uh, you've got the year along the y-axis from 2003 to 14, and then you've got the percent of total samples that are positive, um, ranging from zero to 0.16 percent. Now I want to point out these percentages. 0.16 percent is not 16 percent. 0.16 percent is 0.016. So you've got a very, very small percentage. The green line that you see at the top of the triangles are the producer samples. Those are the individual bulk tank samples. And you can see in the period we're looking at here, the positives have dropped from 0.16% up to 0.16%. Now, 
in half to about 0.08%. So in this about 10 to 12 year period, we've seen half as many producer samples where residues are detected. If you look at the milk tankers, we've also had uh, the percent positive drop from about 0.06% to about 0.15%. And additionally, the red line on the bottom show the results of the FDA going out and buying random gallons of pasteurized milk, testing it for residues, and no positive residues have been detected since approximately 2009. By the way, I want to comment on those residues detected beforehand. Remember, they're detecting it often below a tolerance limit. So it's not that those very, very few that they got positive prior to 2009 were unsafe. They contained residues, which you don't want to be in that milk, but those residues are at minute part per billion levels. So we've done a good job through education and communication and training at, at continuing to, to reduce the number of positive antibiotic test results that we find in the milk. Now, when, we, when the, the tests are run, you can see that this slide shows the drugs that are responsible for these milk residues. What I really want to point out as, uh, on this slide is that most of the tests are run for beta-lactams, and by a long shot, most of the residues that are found in milk are from this class of drug called beta-lactams. This is the class of drugs that includes things like penicillin, ceftiafir, cefaparin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, and the reason that this class of drugs um, results in most of our positive residues is simply because this is the class of drugs that is mostly used to treat dairy cattle. And I'll show you some of that data in just a minute. So by far, the, the, the class that we find are beta-lactams, although there are a few other drugs, things like sulfonamides, tetracyclines, and um, a few other classes that do show up. Now, uh, for several years, whenever I've given a talk about finding drug residues in, um, in milk or in meat from dairy cattle, the number one question that people come up to me with is always, hey, we've heard about this bulk tank testing that the FDA was doing in 2010. Have, have anybody, what do you know about the results? And so for like three or four years, my answer has always been, we're waiting for the results. And, and this testing was done in 2010, and the results were just released early this year. It took them that long to get all the analysis and the reporting all done. This particular program was an attempt to look at bulk milk and determine if there were non-beta-lactam residues or residues of other substances found in milk that weren't being as screened for as intensely. And so the way that they did this is the FDA went into two groups of farms. One group of farms, there were almost a thousand of them, were what they called targeted farms. These were farms that had a history of having a previous tissue residue violation. In other words, they had shipped a cull dairy cow um, that was later detected to have an antibiotic residue. So they had 953 of these targeted farms, and then they went in and they found a comparable number of just random farms that had no history of previous tissue residue violations. They took a a bulk milk sample from all of these 1,800, almost 2,000 farms. These samples were collected randomly and anonymously. They were brought back and they were analyzed using, using very advanced methods for 31 different compounds. And the results are shown in this little table on this slide. So first of all, I think the good news is if you look at the total total percent positive, the percent of positive residues was well under 1% across both groups. I think it was 0.78%. So 99.3% of the 
of the milk samples were free of any detectable residue. So it was, in general, a, a good uh, result and shows that people are working pretty hard to prevent residues. In the targeted farms, they found um, 11 samples that were positive for 12 drugs. So out of those 31 compounds, there were six, ciprofloxacin, sulfamethazine, tilmycosin, florphenicol, telathromycin, and genomycin, where residues were found in the targeted farm group, the group that had had a, his a history of tissue residue violations. Six out of those 12 were florphenicol, and the other were distributed between um, the other compounds I show there. In the random farms, they found four t uh, residues, all four were fluorphenicol. Keep fluorphenicol in mind as we go forward and we talk about the type of, um, of uh, allowable drug usage um, and, and residue testing because um, fluorphenicol is a drug that is not approved for use in lactating dairy cattle. It's not a drug that's illegal, but it's not approved, and it's a drug that has no tolerance. So in general, um, the results were pretty good, but I think the results also told us that we've got to do some more work because really what the public's demanding is this should not be 99.3%, it should be 100%. So when we look at the results of this, I think the story is generally good, but it does show us we need to continue to do some education. All right, so I've talked a little bit about these um, tolerances and uh, understanding the, the word tolerance, drug tolerance, really important to understand relative to understanding how to um, appropriately use drugs on dairy farms. These drug residue tests measure metabolites that are left in milk and left in the, the tissue. These tests are very, very sensitive, and this is one of the hallmarks, I'd have to say, that's happened in my career in the last 30 years, is these, these tests have gotten more and more sensitive, and so now they're detecting, in some instances, not just in parts per million, but in parts per billion. So you're talking something like one drop from an eyedropper in an Olympic-sized swimming pool Will, will be a part per billion residue. And so um, one of the things to understand is that the bar for residues has gotten lower and lower and lower. And the detection of any residues is a potential violation of food safety laws. So for the FDA, they recognize the fact that these tests are um, getting very sensitive. And for FDA approved drugs, the drug withholding periods for, for milk and meat are based on the residue dropping to what they call an approved tolerance. That approved tolerance is a tiny little amount, a part per billion or part per million, that the FDA has determined is not a risk to human health. So if you've got um, uh, uh, below the tolerance and it's detected on the test, then that's okay. But if you're above the tolerance, that's a residue. Now that's fine for drugs that are FDA approved for use in dairy cattle. However, the key thing to understand is that drugs that are not approved for use in dairy cows have zero tolerance. Zero tolerance, meaning detection of any level a test that can detect any residue is a violation of the food safety laws. So some drugs have zero tolerance, and those drugs would include things like mycotil, tilmycosin, nuflor, fluorophenicol, and draxin. Now, if you were in the audience, if we were in a room together, I'd, I'd ask you to raise your hands or somebody to yell out, What's new floor? New floor is fluorphenicol. And then I'd ask you, what was the, the most common residue detected in that, the, the FDA study? Almost all of them were new floor. 
Chlorphenicol, that's a drug with zero tolerance in milk. It's a very, very risky practice to use a drug with a zero tolerance because the milk withholding period for these products, if used in an extra label fashion, and not all these drugs can be used in an extra label fashion, but Nuflor could be, the milk withholding and the meat withholding for those products, and especially the milk withholding, entirely unknown. So why do residues occur? Uh, well, antibiotics are used on most conventional dairy farms. We've done some surveying about about 90% of dairy farms administer antibiotics on a monthly basis. Uh, most antibiotic usage is actually associated with mastitis treatments because mastitis is the most common disease of dairy cattle. And the reason we get residues is because people simply aren't perfect. People occasionally make mistakes. And the mistakes that typically result in the occurrence of residues are mistakes in recording of the treatment, correct identification of the animals, communication among people administering treatments and people milking cows or moving cows among pens, or problems in training people who are administering products or milking cows. Now, um, we've done some work. We've recently published a paper looking at the usage of antibiotics on large Wisconsin dairy herds. Uh, this was published in Journal of Dairy Science in 2014. Uh, we had 50 Wisconsin dairy herds, each containing more than 200 cows. On average, they had about 800 cows. They were about 34,000 cows in this population. They produced about 73 pounds of milk. And by far, treatment of mastitis was the most common reason for treatment of dairy cows. Now this little graph that you, you can see on your screen has um, treatments per 100 cows. And it's got three bars for each of the diseases. So for example, the blue bars are the average rate of treatment. So if you look at the mastitis column, you can see that there were about 40 treatments per 100 cows per year for treatment of mastitis in this population. The least treatments were about six treatments per 100 cows per year. And the most, we had one farm that had about 90 treatments per 100 cows per year for mastitis. You can see that by a long shot, if you look at those blue bars, treatments for mastitis comprise most use of antibiotics. The other thing to notice on this slide is there's a lot of variation for treatment of mastitis, for treatment of pneumonia, for treatment of foot problems, and treatment of diarrhea. So what, what that tells us is, is we've got to look at these herds that are using the highest rate and figure out why, because we've got a lot of variation amongst different farms in how treatments are administered. Now, um, this is data from that same population of 50 herds. And here's the antibiotics that had been used in the prior 12 months for treatment of the less frequent diseases, diarrhea, pneumonia, metritis, and uterine diseases, along with lameness. So you can see for um, what you've got is the number of herds reporting the usage, ranging from zero to 50 herds. We had 50 herds in this data set. And that you can see for diarrhea, we had five herds that used Ceftifur, and we had one or two herds that used um, the other drugs, such as uh, enrofloxacin, um, neomycin, sulfadimethoxine, and other drugs. For foot diseases, you can see the various uh, uh, products that were used. The thing I want to point out is, by far, when we look at non-mastitis diseases, Ceftifur, is the most common treatment by a long shot. And the second thing I want to bring your attention to is the bars that are in this bright red, enrofloxacin, tilmycosin, telathromycin, um, primarily used for treatment of pneumonia. And those are drugs that we would really advise uh, never to use in a lactating dairy cow. Um, well, and, and in fact, enrofloxacin is not permitted for use in lactated dairy cattle. And you can see that the most problematic disease we have is pneumonia. And uh, 
while there's very few farms using those products, those are very, very risky treatments because there's no tolerance for any of those drugs. When we look at the treatments for mastitis in that same population, you can see that 63% uh, of the cases received treatment with just one drug. The, the primary drugs used were either intramammary ceftifir or intramammary cefaparin. And really, we only have about five different classes of, or five different drugs used, ceftifir, cefaparin, perlomycin, amoxicillin, and hedison. Um, we did have some systemic treatments, including ampicillin, ceftifir, oxytet, sulfa, fluorphenicol, and lincomycin, spectinomycin. So you can see that this is the most common use of, mastide, or of, of antibiotics on our farms, and not all of those uses can be justified. So when we look at antibiotic usage on dairy farms, most of it's related to uh, treatment of mastitis, and, and it can be very confusing. The, the, the rules that govern antibiotic usage on farms really are not straightforward. Now, let me show you one of the most confusing rules, I think, of all. You and I think that when we say a lactating cow, that that defines a cow that's being milked. But the FDA has a completely different definition of lactating cow. The FDA defines a lactating cow to be any animal that's 20 months of age or older, regardless of if she's milking or dry, or even if she hasn't calved yet. A lactating cow and the rules for antibiotic use in lactating cow apply to animals greater than 20 months of age, regardless of lactation status. So that's an important thing to understand right there. You can only use drugs that are approved for use in lactating cows for any dairy animal that's 20 months of age or older. So these rules are confusing. Understanding them really requires working very closely with a local vet um, to ensure that all the labels are understood and the rules are known. Let's spend a few minutes going through some of these uh, um, rules and some of the definitions for allowable drug usage. Let's start with um, over-the-counter drugs. One form of allowable drug usage is called over-the-counter. These are drugs that can be purchased without a veterinary prescription, but the key thing to understand with these is these drugs have to be used exactly as the label indicates. If they are used not according to the label, then that over-the-counter drug actually requires a prescription for extra label usage from your veterinarian. So on a practical basis, one over-the-counter drug is procaine penicillin G. The label indication on most of these products is for bacterial pneumonia. The dosage is one cc per 100 pounds. The label reads no more than 10 cc's in one site. And the label reads you can't administer it for any more than four days. The only way this drug can legally be used as an over-the-counter product is to follow all of those label indications. Only bacterial pneumonia, only 1 cc per 100 pounds, no more than 10 cc's in one site, and no more than um, four days. So here's an example of this product. You can see the dosage, which describes all of those things I've given you. And you can also see there's a residue warning on your, the left side of your screen. I'll just blow that up. And that residue warning says, exceeding the daily dosage of 3,000 units per pound of body weight, administering for more than four consecutive days, or exceeding the maximum injection site volume per injection site may result in antibiotic residues beyond the withdrawal time. So the only way over-the-counter products can be used is if they're exactly used according to the label. Second type of allowable drug usage is what we call prescription usage. These products cannot be purchased without a veterinary prescription, but prescription usage is just like over-the-counter over in that it must be used exactly as the label indicates. 
If it is not used exactly according to the label, then you have to have a veterinary label for extra label usage. So let's look at banamine as an example. The banamine label says the indications are pyrexia, that's a big word for fever, associated with bovine respiratory disease, endotoxemia, and acute bovine mastitis. Those are the diseases that banamine has on the label. And it also says then on this particular product, control of inflammation in endotoxemia. The dosage is one to two mLs per 100 pounds by IV administration. If that dosage and that route are followed, then there's a 36 hour milk withhold and a four day meat withhold. What happens though, if you give banamine the same dosage, but intramuscularly? Again, we come back to our FARAD source for milk withholding and meat withholding. And what you'll see in this blue box, species cattle, route IM, the dosage is the same as we've just seen, but now you're giving it intramuscular. Now you've got a meat withholding of 30 days and a milk withholding not of 36 hours, but of 72. So you can see that just the change in the route has dramatically changed the meat and milk withhold. This is an extra label usage of this product. All right, here's, I got another poll question. So in this question, I'd like people to respond to how many drugs are FDA approved for systemic treatment of mastitis. By systemic treatment, I mean an injectable, not intramammary route. So you can say none, you can say one, two, three, or greater than three. Wow, Pam, this could get really exciting. I'm gonna let Abby make her decision there. I I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess if I was gonna be conservative, I, I would say none. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, Abby, do you want any uh, any comment on this one? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with you in that, Mike, and say that there's maybe none that are actually approved for systemic treatment. But um, all right, I'm gonna close the poll. All right. Three, Sounds like a plan. Two, one. All right. So we had 46% of the people get the right answer. The right answer is none. There's not a single product, that an injectable product, that that is approved for treatment of mastitis. If you inject any animal with any product to treat mastitis, that's an extra label usage of that drug and must be done under veterinary supervision. We had 24% of the people say one drug was, we had 19% say um, two, we had uh, 2% say three, and 10% more than three. So the, the correct answer is none. So that's something you have to work very closely with your veterinarian to ensure that you're following allowable drug usage under the extra label guidelines. So the extra label guidelines are any administration of a product that does not exactly follow the label indications and dosage. So that means if you give a different dosage, three cc's versus one, a different frequency, um, twice a day or once a day or for more days than are on the label, a different route, I, IM versus IV, a different animal, a sheep versus a cow, or a different disease, um, mastitis versus foot rot, those are all extra label usage and must be done under the supervision of a veterinarian. So if we come back to that Procaine Pen G, which is an over-the-counter product, if you give three cc's per 100 pounds, that's extra label usage. If you give it for greater than four days, that's extra label usage. If you give it for treatment of metritis, mastitis, or anything else that's not on the label, that's extra label usage. In fact, if you give 15 cc's in one site rather than 10 cc's in one site, that's extra label usage, or if you give it by a different route. Extra label drug usage is permitted only under the supervision of a veterinarian. It's allowed only for FDA approved drugs and um, human drugs. It's not allowed for non-approved compounds, including botanicals. So these herbal things, it's not allowed for that. The veterinarian who is um, responsible for the extra label drug usage 
uh, has to be working closely and have a veterinary client patient relationship with the farm. It's allowed only for therapeutic purposes, not drugs for production use. It's not allowed in any feed or water, and it's not permitted if it results in a violative food residue. And uh, one important thing to understand as well is not all drugs can actually be used in dairy cattle, even by veterinarians. This slide shows the drugs that are prohibited from use in food animals. So you can see that list on the top. But the ones that are a little more confusing are the ones in the bottom. These are the drugs that are prohibited from extra label use in food producing animals. So that means these drugs, like Albon, for example, is a sulfonamide, it's got a label for dairy cattle, but you can not use it for any indication that's not on the label. So if, if you give it for mastitis, that's violating the rule. If you give it for infectious foot rot, that's allowed. And then there's another class of drugs, fluoroquinolones. This would be Baytril or A180 are examples. Those drugs are prohibited from being used in dairy cattle at all. They cannot be used in an extra label fashion in dairy cattle. So let me just come to the extra label use of sulfonamides briefly. The only sulfonamide available for use in dairy cattle older than 20 months of age is sulfadimethoxine. That would be Albon is one label, um, one brand. In adult dairy cattle, this drug can only be used on label and the label reads for the treatment of bovine respiratory disease complex, shipping fever, and bacterial pneumonia associated with pasteurella sensitive to sulfadimethoxine. It's also got necrotic pododermatitis, that's foot rot, and cap diphtheria. That's it. It can only be used for that reason. Um, and any administration of higher doses or sustained release products is also prohibited. Very narrow allowed usage. And this is a drug we often see um, violative uses of. All right, we're going to um, go into a, 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 just three poll questions and wrap it up so we have time. So here's a poll question uh, about a type of drug usage. So we're talking about Albon injectable. On the slide, you can see the label. It's the same label I just read you. And then the question on this poll is, what type of drug usage would this be if given to a fresh cow that had a severe case of mastitis? So if you used Albon, this product, to treat a fresh cow, can we open this poll? Yep, there we go. Would it be a, over the, the counter, would it be prescription, would it be allowable extra label drug usage, or is this product not per permitted? So we'll take wow. just a couple minutes. Yeah, this is going to really test our memory here, Abby. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think it's permitted, but uh, I was listening carefully. I should have, uh, if I had control of the keyboard, I'd have gone back a couple PowerPoints, but that's my vote. Abby, are you in on this? Yeah, I'm thinking it's not permitted if the vet was not involved in making that decision, which I don't think Pam said anything about that. So I'm going to guess per not permitted as well. Okay. Pam. All right. Three, two, one. I'm going to close the poll. This is not permitted usage. This is this sulfa drug and no extra label usage is allowed on this. So we had 80% of the people get this right, it's not permitted. We had 16% of the people say this is allowable extra label usage and we had 2% say prescription, 2% say over the counter. This is the most confusing product. This product cannot be used in an extra label fashion. So a uh, very, very important um, and confusing rule to understand. Okay, next uh, scenario. So here we, we're in a conventional dairy farm, and um, we're talking about Baytril. Baytril, here's the, you can see the product there. You can see I've written the label. Baytril 100 is indicated for treatment of bovine respiratory disease, and it says what pathogens in beef and non-lactating dairy cows. That's what's on this label of this drug. So again, let's open our poll. 
what type of drug use would this be if given to a springing heifer that has a severe case of pneumonia? So you've got over-the-counter prescription, allowable extra label usage by vet or not permitted. Well, I, I think, uh, uh, Pam, I think this is a trick question, but then again, I'm not a very tricky guy. I, you know, the, if it's spring and heifer, I think she's over 20, 20 months of age. So my vote is not permitted. But uh, Addie, you want in on this? I'd say not permitted, too. It seems like she would be considered a lactating animal based on her age and doesn't look like the label allows that. All right. Let's get the final polling done. Three, two, one. We're going to close the poll. We got only 51% of the people getting this right. Mike said it's a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's the real life managing a dairy farm scenario that you get presented with. This is not permitted usage. As Mike and Abby said, this animal is more than 20 months of age. Doesn't This is a fluoroquinolone and rofloxacin. And um, this drug is not allowed for use in, in uh, lactating dairy cattle, and this is a springing heifer. She's considered a lactating dairy cow. This usage would not be permitted. All right, I've got one more scenario. Um, this scenario is we got Polyflex. You can see this product present on, on your uh, screens. I've got the label up here. It says bacterial pneumonia. This is the indication. Bacterial pneumonia, shipping fever, calf pneumonia, and bovine pneumonia caused by, it's got a bunch of bugs. So that's what's on the label as the indication. And again, if we open the poll, what type of drug use would this be if this product was given injectable as an injection to a cow that has mastitis? Is it over-the-counter, prescription, extra label, allowable extra label usage by the vet, or not permitted? Well, here we go. I'm almost willing. I'm getting pretty confident here, Pam. I'm almost willing to bit a piece of pie that it's not permitted. But uh, Abby, do you want to uh, um, have a different view? No, I'm seeing a trend here. Uh, I think this one is also not permitted based on that label description. Well, Pam, what do you think? Okay, I'm going to close my poll. So let me tell you what this poll responded. We're almost evenly divided. We had 49% say extra label usage by vet, 49% say not permitted, 2% said prescription. Um, this, is, uh, this is allowable extra label usage, okay? Um, this is a drug that's approved for use in lactating dairy cattle. If the veterinarian prescribed this, um, as a treatment, it would be allowable extra label usage. It's not prescription because mastitis is not on the label and prescription usage must be on the label and, it's, and it is a permitted use. This is what the extra label guidelines are decided for or designed for. So, all right, let me just finish you up. Uh, let's talk about how to reduce the risk of residues. Um, you can see how confusing some of these, these rules are. Um, I went through all of these scenarios. I know it was fast and still pe it's, it's confusing. One of the key things you can do to reduce the risk of residues is have a strong relationship with your veterinarian, your local veterinarian. Make sure your local vet's involved in animal health decisions, discuss and agree upon treatment protocols, and these things really should be written down. You also have to understand um, differences in allowable types of drug reusage. It's confusing. You need to read the labels. Every product has a label on it, and the label, the person administering and responsible for administering drugs on a farm should read that label. And all extra label drug usage, if it's not on the label, it's either extra label or it's uh, not permitted, so that should be discussed with your local veterinarian. We all know we want to focus on good animal health care, prevent disease, detect it early, and don't treat unless there's an actual diagnosis, because many of the things that occur on dairy farms may not actually require the use of an antibiotic. Another key thing is to decide and limit who's allowed to treat animals, provide training, monitor drug usage, and never, ever, ever treat cows in the milking parlor. It's a very risky place to be administering antibiotics. Treatment should be done in a treatment barn or, or away from the area that the cows are milked, and they should be done where you have time to identify the animal, review her history, and make sure that she actually requires that treatment. We have to identify all animals using permanent IV, ID and uh, keep, keep, keep two types of records, both cow side records that can be referred to 
by the person doing the treatment and permanent cow records um, that, that stay with that cow forever. And then before a cow leaves the farm, double check the rec her records and the history. And, and I really recommend that you have two people responsible for deciding if an animal may leave the farm. You can have one of your drug treatment people um, initially make that decision, hey, she's ready to go, but all of those decisions should be reviewed by someone else just so we have a double check to make sure that we don't have any violations that occur. All right, just to conclude, we want to make sure veterinarians and farmers work closely together. We're all in this together. We want to ensure that drugs are used appropriately. And um, I really recommend that each farm should work with their veterinarian to establish an actual written agreement that defines the role of the veterinarian in, uh, in drug usage on the farm. So with that, um, I think we're at the end. And uh, we've got a couple minutes for some questions, I think, Mike. Abby, do you want to wrap up uh, and uh, talk about the, the future webinars? Sure can. Um, thank you, Pam, for all that great information. I think it's really interesting to hear the history of kind of how the concern for residues has come about and why, you know, why we as dairy producers should care today. And then deciphering those labels, it seems like most of them have all the information on them that we need. It's just figuring out um, you know, how to properly use them on the farm and what's allowable and in what cases. So thank you for sharing that information with our listeners today. And um, if any of you want to listen to this webinar again and kind of take more notes on the information or listen to any of our past webinars, they are all archived. Um, the archives are available at the website www.hordes.com backslash webinars. Um, you can find all of our webinars from the past couple of years there. And um, we've had those webinars been viewed more than 57,000 times. So certainly people are coming back to check them out. And we appreciate that greatly. We hope that you'll make plans to attend our next webinar, which will take place on Monday, October the 12th. The title of that presentation will be A Crop and Feed Outlook for the Months Ahead. Our presenters will be my co-host, Mike Hutchins, along with Mike Rankin, who was a longtime University of Wisconsin Extension agent and is now the current managing editor of Hay and Forage Grower magazine. They'll be talking about that, um, the harvest in 2015 and then a feed outlook for 2016. So some great information that they will both be able to use their expertise and share with us in that next webinar. That webinar will be sponsored by Zinpro Performance Minerals. So um, we appreciate their support on that one. Mike, I think now would be a great time to go through some of the questions from our listeners. I'm sure they've got some good ones out there for Pam to tackle. Yep. Uh, here we go, Pam. Uh, on the speed round, uh, you mentioned approved tolerance. H how is this determined by FDA? What is an approved allowance for a certain drug for uh, in milk? You can go into actually the internet, and the tolerances are listed out there. So they they do that through their pharmacologic studies, where they do these residue depletion studies. The manufacturer of drugs has to do that, and um, they they very very closely monitor how how long it takes for drugs to get to certain levels and sensitivity of the test. If you just Google uh, FDA tolerances for milk, you'll probably find that document. It's not too hard to find. Okay. Uh, the, I think the, the, the initial question was, uh, how did they determine what is, what is a tolerance? How many parts per billion? In other words, you can't do rat research on this and you can't do human research. How do, uh, how do they get that number that they publish? Uh, I suspect it's actually done in rat research. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That would be uh, the the uh, manufacturer's responsibility for doing that. Okay. Here's another question. What should be the ideal IMM for, and i got to scroll down here because my box is mildly small, for lactating dairy cows? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. That, so that means what's the ideal intramammary product for, for lactating dairy cattle? And, uh, boy, I could speak for three hours on that. Um, and uh, so... Uh, it really depends on the pathogen that's causing the infection. And um, probably on most farms today, about uh, somewhere between 20 and 40% of the cases are culture negative at detection. And the answer on those 20 to 40% is most of those require no antibiotics because what you're seeing is inflammation, not actually active infection. Um, the vast majority that actually will respond to and require treatment are gram-positive 
pathogens such as uh, streptococci, especially some chronic coag negative staphs, and those will respond to um, any of the intramammary products really that we have available out there today. Okay. Now, the neat question here, is there evidence that metabolites can contribute to antibiotic resistance? Yeah, great question. Um, the answer to that is I'm not aware of any evidence that has been able to link drug metabolites to resistance of mastitis pathogens. So in, I'd say right now there isn't any evidence on that. Okay. Uh, another nursing question. In what form must the ELDU uh, be given? In other words, uh, is a protocol signed by the veterinarian, prescription form, letterhead? What, what makes it happen? So the, extra, so the key thing is to come to an understanding of veterinary client-patient relationship, which has a bunch of criteria, but basically boils down to you have a relationship with a local veterinarian who can respond to problems on the farm, uh, who is familiar with and can do a diagnosis of animals and who feels confident that they can prescribe the drugs. And the, the, um, the, the thing at the farm end is, uh, the key thing is that you've agreed to follow their recommendations. And um, that can be done verbally, but it's best done by coming up with what we call uh, a veterinarian of record, where you have an actual written agreement with the farm. And any other veterinarian who may happen to visit your farm, let's say a technical service veterinarian for a, a company or a veterinary consultant that may be flushing cows or something, or a veterinarian that works for your feed company, the, the thing that that's important when with with them is that they agree not to make any recommendations without conferring with your veterinarian of record. And, and that really keeps things simple because it, then you don't end up with a lot of confusion about who's making the recommendations for drug usage on the farm. A bit long question. Here we go. Banamine, from an animal welfare standpoint, and from what I understand, should not be administered IM because of muscle damage. Is there a reason to ever give banamine in uh, IM versus IV? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I would not recommend the use of banamine IM for any reason. Okay. Very quick. Uh, uh, at parts per billion being so low, is there any, can there be false positive with the test kits? If you're testing for and, and, and testing an individual cow, uh, should you, uh, uh, sh let me get this here. Uh, oops, I got to go back one more, one more slide here. We'll be all set. Uh, our sh uh, individual cows, uh, should you milk the entire udder or just uh, a few strips for, into a clean vial? So there is no validated residue test kit for individual cow milk samples. The test kits are validated for bulk tank milk. And several studies have demonstrated a higher rate of false positive on an individual cow basis because they're not validated for that use. So yes, you will get most likely, so you, you can get, I shouldn't say you will, but you can get false positives. And... Um, the key is uh, it's really better to get a false positive than to get a false negative. But again, it's very important to recognize that tests haven't been developed for that usage. So if, if I got a cow and I'm suspicious, can I use the test kit then, uh, Pam, to, uh, to, to, to determine if that cow can go in the tank or is that not really a valid thing to do? So the valid thing to do would be after the, the withholding period is over. To, if you want to test that milk just to be double sure, that's the time to use it. One thing you never want to do is use those test kits before the uh, milk withholding period is over. Another important thing on using these test kits is you have to recognize that not all the tests can detect all the drugs. Your processor may be using a test kit and looking for different drugs as compared to the test kit you're using on your farm. So you have to use the right test kit for the drug that's been administered. That's another reason, very important to work with the local veterinarian uh, relative to um, using drugs and using the right residue detection method. Here, here's the last question we have right now, and our time is getting away from us. Do you believe, uh, we, it looks like there's a plateau of 0.08% on the producer. Do you, do you think we're, that's just a number that's going to stay pretty static, or do you think we're going to actually see that number go even lower? I mean, it, it, we've, we've cut it in half over, over the slide you showed to us. What, what's your thoughts? Can, can, what, what's realistically possible, do you think, in your estimation? 
Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I just updated that slide recently with 2014, and I was su- surprised really um, that, that it's plateaued. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe we have plateaued maybe because of the testing or, or maybe we will begin to go lower because this first couple of years, really, we've seen this plateau. So I think we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Well, Abby, we got all the questions answered. I know we're running a little bit late here. Uh, I'll turn it back to you to wrap up. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, Again, thank you, Pam, for a job well done. Really great presentation that um, I think a lot of our listeners will find a lot of value in. So thanks for taking the time to be with us today. I also want to thank Neogen Corporation for partnering with us and sponsoring the webinar. You can learn more about their company by visiting the website, which is on the slide. We appreciate their support of our webinar series. Um, So thanks to them again. We want you to keep in mind our next webinar, which will be held on October 12th at noon central time. We'll be talking about the 2015 harvest season and the feed outlook for 2016. So we hope that you will consider joining us for that. Until next time, I'd like to say farewell to all of our listeners from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman and at the University of Illinois. Thanks for joining us.